now recording. Hey, uh, welcome back, everybody. Uh, we had a very informative um, learning experience this morning um, uh, with uh, with Chris Milley, and we're now uh, ready to continue on um, with uh, Jamie Simpson. What I'll do is they'll just call formally call the meeting back to order, and uh, just a reminder that. Uh, um, if you're looking at for the agenda, it's uh, on our website on, on the agenda uh, link and it's under the PAC October 25th meeting. This is just a continuation of all of the, the uh, learning experiences meetings that we've, we've had. So it's really just one, one meeting technically. Uh, so um, uh, what, welcome uh, um, Mr. Simpson and, and as before we've, we've got, we have 45 minute time slots essentially a half, half hour per presentation and then 15 uh, minutes for Q&A. So I'll, I'll, I'll hand the floor over um, to, uh, to Mr. Simpson. He's an environmental lawyer at Juniper Law and uh, thank him in advance for, uh, for his time and, and helping us understand the aquaculture uh, industry uh, better. Mr. Simpson. Great, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to Pleasure to be here. Thank you for the uh, for the invitation. Um, <clears throat> we get through this without anyone falling asleep. I'll uh, I'll consider it a success. Um, now I'm not super familiar with how to share my screen, so I'm just going to uh, see if I can make that happen to see if I can get the presentation to come up. <clears throat> Um, you're, you're, you're quite good at it. We've, we've got your screen, but the, the slides are showing on the left-hand side. So it's in, uh, it's not in presentation. There we go. We're in presentation. Okay. Awesome. <clears throat> okay. And happy to, um, happy to take questions. If anyone, uh, you know, if anyone has questions, don't hesitate to ask. And, uh, and if I don't know the answer, I'm happy to uh, get back to you with, uh, with an answer. Um, and uh, so what I'm going to do is basically just kind of run through the, in broad strokes, the regulatory regime of, uh, of agriculture uh, regulation here in Nova Scotia, and, um, and then just talk a little bit about enforcement of, uh, of uh, environmental regulation here in Nova Scotia. Um, so who regulates aquaculture? Well, interestingly enough, it's, it's not actually consistent across Canada. It, um, it, it, it's, there's a, generally speaking, there's a combination of both federal and provincial regulation, although that varies from province to province. Um, there's been some court challenges over the, over the, over the province's um, legislative authority to uh, regulate aquaculture. And in, and in BC, uh, basically, it was determined that the province doesn't have uh, legal authority to regulate aquaculture. Um, and that case was never appealed, so it sort of sits on the books there in BC. Uh, so that's that's one of the reasons why we have this kind of hodgepodge across across the country of uh, who who actually has the the, the legal authority to regulate uh, aquaculture. Um, in the near future, we may have um, a, a prevent uh, sorry a federal aquaculture act. I know that our current minister is committed to bringing in and uh, our for current uh, federal minister of fisheries is is uh, committed to bringing in a federal aquaculture act. However, the draft um, kind of policy statements around the act doesn't really seem to offer much in terms of, um, um, you know, regulation in terms of the environmental impacts, potential impacts of aquaculture. It seems to be more focused uh, at this point, at least on promoting aquaculture. Um, and it would also, uh, interestingly enough, not really override any current provincial regulation of aquaculture. And so for that reason, it wouldn't really provide a, a standardization of regulation across the country. So it looks like even though we may be getting a federal act in the near future, it, at this point anyway, it doesn't look like we would be seeing a standardized regulation of, of aquaculture across the country. So that just means that we come back to relying on our um, provincial um, uh, you know, prevent combination of provincial federal regulation on a province by province basis. What the, what the federal government does have authority for ac across the country is of course the Fisheries Act and then any, uh, and then 
any and all of the regulations under the Fisheries Act, including the Aquaculture Activities Regulation. So the Fisheries Act, of course, has provisions in it that, um, that uh, prohibit uh, you know, destruction of fish and fish habitats, um, except as, author as authorized, of course and also the uh, prohibition of uh, release of deleterious substances into water, and uh, of course, unless authorized. Um, and uh, speaking of authorization, the Aquaculture Activities Regulations of 2015, uh, they were created to authorize certain activities of aquaculture under the Fisheries Act. So where they might be um, illegal otherwise, um, they are officially authorized uh, thanks to these regulations. And uh, deleterious substances, um, uh, as defined in the in the acts, uh, sorry, as defined in the regulations, um, the agriculture activities regulations talk about regulated drugs, uh, pest control products, and then materials that are known as biochemical oxygen demanding matter. <laughs> so, um, so these are um, allowed uh, thanks to the regulations. They're authorized with with certain conditions. So if we, oh, uh, the other thing that I'll mention with respect to the federal government is that they also have authority over transferring of fish. So anytime uh, fish that's to be used in aquaculture is transferred, whether it's within a province or whether it's between provinces, also requires a license. And that is uh, falls to the authority of the federal government. Um, so when we look at uh, Nova Scotia, we have our Fisheries and Coastal Resources Act. And the general purpose there is to promote sustainable aquaculture. And then we have a number of um, purpose provisions in the act that talk about encouraging, promoting, implementing programs to sustain and improve aquaculture, uh, the sustainable growth of aquaculture industry, um, et cetera, uh, recognizing it as a legitimate and valuable use of the, um, of the province's coastal resources, uh, et cetera. <clears throat> Um, under our Fisheries and Coastal Resources Act here in Nova Scotia, there's two, uh, two main things that, uh, that the Act does. One is it requires a license to carry on aquaculture, whether it's marine-based or land-based. And it, um, it creates uh, what's called the, um, the Aquaculture Review Board. And, uh, and this board is responsible for issuing licenses, making licensing decisions for areas that are both marine and, and an undesignated area. So an area that's not designated as a dedicated aquaculture marine area. Um, so basically new licenses outside of these designated areas, also marine. When it comes to licenses for land-based aquaculture, uh, that's decided by and issued by um, uh, a, basically a staff person uh, who is appointed um, you know, by the minister. And, uh, and there's no specific factors that are listed in the act or in the regulations that are to be considered by the administrator. It's just some sort of internal process, I presume, uh, but not that's regulated. Um, and that of course is much different from a licensing procedure for a marine based site in an undesignated area. Um, so there's two key regulations under the Aquaculture Act and uh, that refer to these two functions that I just talked about, the aquaculture license and lease regulations and the aquaculture management regulations. <clears throat> so the aquaculture license and lease regulations, 2015, these, these kind of talk, these, basically this is the nuts and bolts of how aquaculture licenses and leases are issued. Um, sections 33 and 34, uh, those are the sections that deal with land-based aquaculture licenses. And again, um, these for land-based, there are not any factors that are listed that are, would be specific to, um, to the environment, potential environmental fac, uh, um, impacts of, um, of land-based aquaculture, which is, which is a different scenario from the marine-based aquaculture. So there's this distinction that's made both in the act and in the regulations between marine-based and land-based sites. Um, section 56 requires a security bond, but again, um, that's only for marine-based aquaculture sites and not required for a land-based site. So we turn to the aquaculture management regulations, also 2015. 
Um, all aquaculture sites do require, uh, the, the, the regulations do require a farm management plan. Um, this is kind of similar to like any kind of farming operation, a uh, commercial farming operation in Nova Scotia where, you know, some sort of a farm management plan is required. Well, similarly with aquaculture, uh, these plans are required. Um, <clears throat> there is a requirement for environmental monitoring um, that contained within the, within the plan. Uh, and for marine-based uh, aquaculture facilities, uh, there's, there's quite an extensive list of requirements that are required for the monitoring component within that management plan. When we come to land-based sites, there, is, there, are, there are no specific monitoring requ requirements, although the minister does have the power to, uh, to require um, specific monitoring requirements, uh, but, um, but it's, not, it's not required under the regulations. And then, we, and then kind of flowing out of this requirement to have a management plan and to have monitoring within the management plan, uh, this thing called the Agriculture Environmental Monitoring Programs. And these are required, again, for marine-based aquaculture, but are not required unless the minister decides to require them uh, for land-based aquaculture sites. So enforcement, um, there's you know, a variety of ways that the, that the, that the province can, can enforce the, uh, the requirements under the, under the regulations or under the, the Fisheries and Resource, uh, Coastal Resources Act. Um, everything from giving directives, which are, you know, basically just asking or, well, telling uh, someone who's perhaps allegedly violated the act to, to do something, uh, but uh, not with fairly, not with very serious consequences. Uh, warnings can be given, um, something known as a ministerial order can be given, which kind of elevates the, um, elevates the situation, has more serious consequences if, if it's, if the order is not obeyed. Uh, and then finally, can fine and perhaps even go to court uh, to charge somebody with an offense under these under these acts. The fines for alleged violations of the aquaculture license and uh, and lease regulations range from range from um, uh, they seem to range from around one hundred and eighty dollars to just under three thousand dollars. And uh, and if you uh, if you want to take a look at um, at these. Uh, uh, violations or alleged violations. You, there's actually a website that the Department of Environment here in Nova Scotia has where you can go and look at all these uh, fines that have been levied for, uh, for various, uh, various infractions of, of various regulations or, or acts. Um, <clears throat> in, um, there's only been, uh, since this registry was created in January of 2018, there's only been three recorded fines under the Fisheries and Coastal Resources Act. And they range from, you know, three hundred and fifty-two dollars to around thousand dollars. And although none of them appear to be aquaculture related, as, as far as I can tell, there have been no fines issued for aquaculture related activities under the Fisheries and Coastal Resources Act. Um, so, you know, the question is: uh, some people question whether there is a failure to enforce our regulations. Here in Nova Scotia, uh, there was a study done by the East Coast Environmental Law Association of enforcement actions taken under the Environment Act, and their conclusion was that um, that the penalties associated might be little more than just simply a, a cost of doing business, where the the median fine uh, for the violations of the Environment Act was around five hundred dollars. So for you know for an individual, that might be enough to deter uh, deter someone from doing these things, uh, but uh, deter, you know, potential violations, but for a, but for a business, you know, 500 bucks is, is not, uh, not exactly um, a lot of money. And so it might be just considered more just sort of the cost of doing business. And, you know, we've seen, of course, the recent example of Cook Agriculture's uh, rattling beach sites in the news lately, and they, you know, allegedly have been operating in an area that was, um, that was three times the size of the area that it was actually given under its lease uh, for some 17 years, and there had been no um, no enforcement to try to change that situation. The province didn't seem to um, bother to, uh, you know, to to use any of the tools that it had to try to bring Cook into compliance with the uh, with the lease. So with that, I'll say thank you, and uh, certainly happy to answer any questions if anybody has. And I'm going to. Um, 
see if I can escape out of this and get back to uh, seeing you folks. There, okay, you're also yeah. there, I think. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Mr. Simpson. I'll, and I'll open the floor um, uh, for a fantastic presentation and I'll open the floor to questions. And again, we're using the, the, the hand and I see a couple of people are in the queue. So uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll cede the floor to, uh, to Councillor Durkee, Councillor Durkee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Jamie. I do have a couple of questions. I noticed that there's a, a difference between the regulations on land, land, significant difference between the regulations on land-based and marine-based. But considering um, uh, what if we have a land-based um, company, but they want to discharge into the ocean, do they have, would they fall under marine or would they fall under land? Yeah, so they would fall under the, the land-based uh, requirements, land-based aquaculture requirements, as far as the, um, the provincial law and regulations go. Um, so they would not be required to have the, um, the monitor, they, they wouldn't have the same monitoring requirements, for example, as a marine-based operation. And, um, but uh, in terms of the Fisheries Act, there would still be, they would, you know, they would still fall under the aquaculture activities regulations under the Fisheries Act. And so if there were violations under that, they would be, you know, theoretically at least uh, still accountable for, uh, for those. Okay, so that means there would not be a, a security bond that would be required for uh, a company that was in, um, based on land. Yeah, as far as I can tell from the regulations, that that security bond requirement does not apply to a um, to a to a land based operation. Right. So um, again, here we have though a situation uh, with Cooks that was you know recently in the news about the fact that they're uh, expanded way beyond what they're supposed to be, and yet no fines have been um, have been given. Does that not question whether or not we, the Nova Scotia government's doing due diligence and, um, following through like, yeah, so, you know, that's a hard question for you to answer, yeah, but, yeah. but that's the question that, that we would raise is, uh, uh whoops, yeah. it's, if they do that, what else can other organizations do? Yeah. I mean, you know, having the laws on the books is one thing. <laughs> And then um, making sure that those laws are enforced is, is, is another thing. So, um, you know, and, and not to say that, you know, government makes choices and the enforcement folks in government makes, make choices regarding when and whether to enforce certain laws. Um, and, uh, but yeah, so arguably sometimes it's not enforced as much as citizens may want. Um, Sometimes we feel that they're enforced too much, <laughs> but yeah, exactly. uh, but yeah, but that's um, it, yeah, two separate issues there: the the actual laws on the books, and then whether or not those laws are actually enforced. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you, Thank for you the Councillor Gerke. Um, Councillor Cushing. Oh, Councillor Cushing, you're on mute. Yep, I got you now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Councillor Durge asked the number of the questions I was going to. Um, it seems like uh, uh, you alluded to about uh, um, there's no consistent right across Canada for any type of, uh, <clears throat> of uh, cooperation between the federal government and the provincial governments in issuing licenses and whatnot. And am I correct that you mentioned that uh, if a uh, uh, land-based aquaculture business wanted to start up, It'd be up to the minister just to appoint somebody to authorize that license. Uh, it seems like there's there's not much of a process here. It just you know you get the per right right person in the right frame of mind and uh, issue the license. Is that correct? Well, um, good question. And I like so as far as the regulations tell us, you know, if it's a marine based operation outside of an already designated aquaculture area, then there is a more extensive decision making process at play. Um, and that, you know, that would fall to the aquaculture review board to go through the process of, um, of making the decision about the license to be issued. Um, in the case of a land based aquaculture site, though, it does seem that it falls to the uh, 
to 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 a staff person within the department uh, to mm. make that decision. And there's not a lot of information within the regulations that tell us how that decision is made or what factors are considered in that decision making process. Yeah, it, it doesn't sound very encouraging. It, it would be a question. Um, it would be a question to put to government to see what they would be willing to to tell, uh, you know, an interested party about how that decision is made. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, PAC member uh, Kamal. Um, thank you, uh, Jamie. Um, I've got about three questions. Uh, one. Um, who uh, who does it fall to for enforcement? Is it the uh, Nova Scotia Department of Fisheries or is it the Nova Scotia Department of Environment or is there a separate arm under agriculture that does it? Um, secondly, with land-based, um, is there anything that the Nova Scotia Department of Environment would become involved in with effluent release either on land or into the ocean? Yeah, good, good questions. Um, so if it's, if it's a violation or alleged violation under the Fisheries Act, then it would of course fall to the federal government uh, fisheries officer um, to, or conservation officer to, um, you know, to, to determine whether there's been a violation and, and to en enforce a potential violation. If, if it's a violation under the uh, Fisheries and Coastal Resources Act, then it would fall to Department of Environment staff, enforcement staff to, uh, to deal with that, you know, alleged potential violation. Um, and then, um, sorry, your last question, uh, sorry, remind me again what last question was. Uh, wondering if the uh, Department of Environment would become involved if there was any uh, effluent release either on land or marine from a land-based. Yes, so if it's, if it's a, um, a, a release of a, you know, a, an alleged deleterious substance, and that's um, you know that's using the language from the from the Environment Act. Uh, so if there is a potential release of a, of a deleterious substance um, as defined in the Act, then it would be Department of the Nova Scotia Department of Environment that would be responsible for addressing that potential violation of the Act. Uh, so and that would be on land. Uh, if it were in the water, then that would fall to the federal um, the federal government to to enforce. Okay, and uh, I guess one last thing, do you know, and this may be out of your area of expertise, do you know if any of these enforcement agencies do site visitations or if they're just depending on reports to them of uh, violations? They certainly have the power to investigate as they, as they deem fit. Um, how much that is driven by complaints and how much it is driven by sort of a proactive part on the government, I, I can't say. But that would be that would be a good question to ask the, uh, the enforcement branch. Thank you. There, there is in the in the Environment Act there is a provision where uh, citizens have the right to report instances of suspected violations of the Act. Um, <laughs> it's my cat. Um, so there is you know there is that option to report suspected uh, violations of the act in the Environment Act, uh, not not the same in the um, in the Fisheries and Coastal Resources Act, but nonetheless, I'm sure that uh, that citizens can uh, report suspected instances of violations under the act. Okay, and uh, Councillor Hel Hilton's next in the queue for a question. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess just to actually follow up to Warner's, um, it, it, you keep mentioning um, um, how they can uh, how they can report suspected incidents um, that have occurred, um, but with land based, you're saying kind of that there isn't a whole lot of monitoring until an incident occurs. Would that be a true statement? Um, it uh, it falls to I mean they do have to have a um, a fire management plan, and monitoring would I would. I would think would be a part of that plan, but the specific aspects of that monitoring plan are not defined as they would be if it were a marine-based site. Um, the minister has the power to say, you know, I want X, Y, Z monitored in your plan, but that is not laid out in the in the regulations as it is for for marine-based sites. 
um, and just follow up to that, uh, I, my original question was going to be what, like, could you provide a little bit of insight into why you, why there's such a lack of uh, regulation and enforcement for land based? Is it because it's so new? Um, or is do you see a, like a different reason for that? Because there seems to be a big difference between marine regulations and land based regulations. Yeah, and I, I can't say, I mean, I can't say what the government's reasoning is for that. I can, I can guess, <laughs> uh, you know, if, if I had to take a guess, I would say that they, the government felt that there was less risk um, with land-based operations compared to marine-based operations, aquaculture operations. Um, and then that's why they, they had, um, yeah, different regulations between the two. Um, but uh, that's that's just a guess on on my part. Thank you. Thank you. Um, are there additional questions from PAC? Okay. Uh, yes, uh, Ms. Brox, CEO Brox. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, not a member of the PAC, but do have a question from staff for Jamie, if that's okay. Just Jamie, uh, we've received so much material as we've been on this learning journey and just a question for you around a terminology that you used in an earlier slide. Um, when we were talking about the deleterious uh, matter, what is your understanding of what biochemical oxygen demanding matter is? Right, is defined in the aquaculture activities regulations. And so I would just basically just recommend going straight to that and then to see what it says. There's also an accompanying guidance document that the federal government has put out. And that would be a very useful document for, for anyone that's particularly interested in how the federal government um, regulates these, these things. Um, so it, uh, anyway, it's available on, on the web and, and shouldn't be too hard to find. Um, so yeah, yeah. Better than me trying to <laughs> say, say something I don't know too much about. So uh, yeah, go right to the right to the source documents there. Okay, additional questions from PAC or staff? Okay, I don't see any. And um, I, I guess what I'd like to do is I'd like I'd like to thank you, uh, Mr. Simpson, for the for the insight from a legal perspective that you've uh, you've given us. It's all helpful and. Um, it's an incremental ad for sure on on our, our understanding of aquaculture. So, so thank you on behalf of the PAC and uh, and um, looking forward to uh, to uh, you know our our uh, our move forward. Absolutely. Oh, yeah, we, and we've got uh, Ms. Durkee. Sorry, my apologies. I'm just clapping. Oh, you're just clapping. <laughs> Not a hand oh, up. It's, uh, it's to the side, right? Okay. <laughs> and uh, if, if anyone has any follow-up questions, don't hesitate to get in touch. I'm happy to uh, do what I can to, you know, either answer questions or at least point you uh, point you in the right direction for for the regulations or guidance documents or as I as I can. So happy to happy to do that. Okay, and your appearance here today is very much appreciated. Thanks so much. Okay, take care, all. Okay. <clears throat> so our next session. It's now. I'm looking on my screen. It's 1:30 ish. And our next sessions with uh, Brian Muldoon, he's a concerned citizen. So uh, I'll, I'll ask uh, for a motion to recess until two o'clock. Got a motion, uh, got a mover in uh, Councillor Hilton, Councillor uh, Bushing seconded, all those in favor? All those opposed? Motion carried, okay. Uh, see everybody at two o'clock and, uh, and uh, we'll pick up there. Thanks so much. Thank you.